Hi, and welcome again to Stranger Than Fiction. In the last video, I talked about how it's possible that, on a really small scale, particles actually behave like waves. I told you that the wave that describes a particle is called a wave function, and in that video, I used a sine wave as an example wave function. But real wave functions actually have more complicated shapes than that. What a wave function really looks like depends a lot on what particle we're interested in and what things are in its environment. For instance, suppose we want to look at the wave function of an electron. If the electron were the only thing in the whole universe, there'd be no restriction on where the electron could be. We'd be equally likely to find it anywhere. So the wave function would stretch out forever, and it would have the same amplitude everywhere we looked. But that's not a very realistic example. So now let's think about something that really does exist. Electrons are usually found in atoms, like this hydrogen atom. Hydrogen has a proton in the middle and an electron going around it. When we picture a hydrogen atom, most people think of something like this. But it's important to remember that this picture is very simplified. As I showed you in earlier videos, an electron spreads out like a wave. But this electron isn't like a sine wave, so let's think about what wave it would look like. First of all, Remember that the proton has a positive charge, and the electron has a negative charge. So the electron will be attracted to the center of the atom, and that means we're more likely to find the electron close to the center. So we expect that our wave function will have a higher amplitude close to the proton than it will have out here. So for an atom, like this hydrogen atom, the wave function of the electron won't look anything like a sine wave. And things are more complicated for a large atom. For instance, oxygen atoms have eight electrons, not just one. Those electrons are attracted to the nucleus just like in the hydrogen atom, but this time each electron is also repelled by the other seven electrons. That makes it a lot harder to decide where the electrons are most likely to be, and the wave function can be a lot more complicated. And finally, now let's think about a water molecule. In water, you have three atoms, two hydrogens and one oxygen. So there's 10 electrons total, and each one is repelled by the other electrons and attracted by the nuclei in the three atoms. Figuring out where the electrons end up in a molecule is a tough problem, and it'll take a while for us to be able to work through it, but here's a sneak preview. Here's the model of a water molecule. The oxygen atom is red, and the two hydrogens are white. This model shows you where the atoms are, but it doesn't show you the electrons. So what's the shape of the wave function of the electrons? Well, the answer depends on how much energy the electrons have, but here is one possibility. Now, at first, this doesn't look like a wave at all, but remember, we're looking at the crest of a wave in three dimensions, as in this old movie logo. In this picture, you can imagine that the wave is spreading out from the tip of the antenna in three dimensions, so this wave is shaped like a sphere. Now the wave function around the water molecule is definitely not shaped like a sphere, but it is still the crest of a wave. So why is this electron shaped that way, and how can we figure out what the wave functions of other molecules are shaped like? We really want to know that, because the wave function gives us a lot of information about a molecule. It does much more than just tell you where the electrons are. If we want to use quantum mechanics to create new technology and understand things like chemical reactions and lasers and radiation, we first need to know what wave functions look like and how they act. The person who first started thinking about wave functions and quantum mechanics is someone you've probably already heard of, Erwin Schrödinger, the same guy Schrödinger's cat is named after. Schrödinger was a really colorful character. He was almost as famous for the scandals he had in his private life as for his scientific work. He had quite a few affairs outside his marriage with the consent of his wife, Anne-Marie, and he fathered several children with other women. As a matter of fact, in 1925, he and one of his mistresses were staying at a resort when he made his greatest discoveries in quantum mechanics. Schrodinger realized that the energy anything has is related to its wave function. Here's the equation he came up with that connects the wave function to the energy. This is probably the single most important equation in quantum mechanics, and it's known as the Schrodinger equation. To really understand it, we'd have to use calculus, but I'll give you the general idea right now. This symbol 
is the Greek letter psi, and it represents the wave function. So psi is the equation of the wave that we're looking at, and E is the energy. So all of this stuff on the left is equal to E times the equation of the wave function. So what is all this stuff on the left? Well, this side of the equation has two parts. The first part is the kinetic energy. Basically, it's the energy that comes from the motion of what we're studying, whether it's atoms or molecules or dust bunnies. So that part of the equation tells us how much energy comes from the movement of those things. So the first term is for the kinetic energy. The second term tells us the potential energy. Now, potential energy is a little harder to define. Basically, it's the energy that results from all the forces that are acting on an object. For instance, take these two magnets. If I hold them apart, like this, the magnets are attracting each other. There's a force trying to pull them together. So because of those forces, the magnets have a lot of potential energy. If I let them go, the magnets move toward each other. Now remember, moving objects have kinetic energy. So when I let go of the magnets, some of their potential energy was converted into kinetic energy. And at the end, the magnets have come together and stopped moving. So now the magnets don't have kinetic energy anymore. But there's still a force pulling them together, so the magnets still have some potential energy. Here's another example. Right now, this spring doesn't have very many forces acting on it, so it has a low potential energy. It's also not moving, so it has a low kinetic energy too. But now I'll stretch the spring, and when I do, I can feel that there are forces pulling the spring back together. Those forces mean that the spring now has more potential energy than it did before I stretched it. Another example is electrical charges. If you have an electron, which has a negative charge, near a proton, which has a positive charge, there's a force that pulls them together. So that means this system has a potential energy. So what does that have to do with the Schrodinger equation? Well, suppose we wanted to study an atom. In order to understand the atom using quantum mechanics, we need to know its wave function. And to get that, we have to use the Schrodinger equation. Remember, these two parts of the equation are for the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So if we know those, and we know the total energy, E, we can solve this equation for psi, the wave function. That's how we'll find out what the wave function looks like. So, for example, here's a lithium atom. There are three electrons, and each one is attracted by the nucleus and repelled by the other electrons. Because of those forces, each electron has a potential energy. The electrons are also moving really fast, so they have kinetic energy too. So to use the Schrodinger equation, we have to figure out what to put here for the potential energy V. When we know that, we'll be able to figure out the wave function. And that's important, because when we know the wave function, we can use it to figure out how the system we're studying behaves and what its properties are. And that'll make it possible for us to create new technology. One other thing I want to point out is that this animation of an atom I showed you is a little misleading. Remember, electrons act like waves, not like little balls as in this picture. So they don't travel in circles like you see here. Instead, they're spread out. The electrons are spread out in space like the ones we saw in this earlier picture. So getting back to the Schrodinger equation, here's what we need to do in order to use quantum mechanics to learn new things about molecules and use them in interesting ways. First, we have to figure out E, the total energy, and V, the potential energy. When we know that, we can use the Schrodinger equation to find the wave function and that'll make it possible to understand all kinds of new things about the molecule. And that's what I'll do in the next few videos. We'll look at some examples and figure out their wave functions, and when we know them, we'll be able to start using that information to create new technologies. In fact, the very first example I'm going to show you is really important for designing smaller and more powerful microchips for computers and tablets. We'll also start to see some of the strange ways matter behaves on a really small scale. So that'll be in the next video. In the meantime, if you haven't seen my earlier videos about quantum mechanics, I hope you'll give them a look too. And thanks for watching.